This podcast is brought to you by Podcast Nation. You are listening to As a Woman, Episode 92, The COVID Vaccine. In this episode, we are talking about the COVID vaccine, claims about infertility and sterility, and what you should know if you are pregnant, trying to get pregnant, or undergoing fertility treatments. Welcome to As a Woman, the podcast hosted by fertility physician, Dr. Natalie Crawford, to educate and empower women. Each week, learn about your health, your fertility, and how they relate to your true self. Become a part of the community, fostering collaboration over competition while learning how to authentically find your voice and amplify others as a woman. Hey friends, welcome back. We are talking about the COVID vaccine. To be clear, I'm kind of sick of talking about it. I don't mean that harshly. I just mean I've covered this in a couple YouTube videos. So I'm going to start right out by saying, I think this is covered best on YouTube. There's a visual. We can talk about studies. You can see things. So I'm going to direct you and I've never done this. Here we are minute one of the podcast and I'm telling you this information is best received in video format and I have two YouTube videos you can go and watch. The first one is about the false claim that the COVID vaccine is female sterilization and busting that myth. And the second one is answering the question, should you take the vaccine if you're pregnant, trying to get pregnant or undergoing fertility treatments? I'm going to summarize them here. That's because I know that this is important information and not everybody will watch a YouTube video. For some people, that is just not a preferred medium for getting information. And so I'm going to go over it here in summary, but it is more in depth and better on YouTube. So please, if you're really interested or you're curious, go watch the YouTube videos, subscribe to the channel and share. The first thing I want to say is that I am talking about the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, which are mRNA. mRNA is messenger RNA. This is why when we talk about the COVID vaccine and we're talking about an mRNA vaccine, It's different than live virus vaccines. mRNA is messenger RNA. How the body works is mRNA is a template that tells your body to translate the code into proteins. You can have DNA that gets transcribed into messenger RNA, and then messenger RNA gets translated into protein. It is a normal step in the process of making proteins, which, by the way, our whole bodies are made up of proteins. So instead of a live virus vaccine or a DNA vaccine where you're getting a piece of the virus or it's integrating into your own DNA, this is brilliant. It's totally skipping that step. So you're getting the middleman who's not touching your DNA. We're not going backwards. We're just going forwards. And so what happens is that your body gets the message from the messenger RNA that it needs to encode the proteins for the spike protein or the S protein which is part of coronavirus. And so your body starts to make that protein. Your body then makes the S protein and your immune system responds appropriately and says, hold up, hold up, foreign material, let's make some antibodies to it. So your body senses that you're not normally having this S protein and then it makes the antibodies, which is great because then if you ever encounter the S protein, for example, if you're exposed to coronavirus, your body's going to say, hey, we already have an antibody for this. We already made it because of that cool vaccine that we got. And so then you already have the appropriate immune response to not get sick from COVID. That is how the vaccine works. Now, I'm going to address question one first. Should you get the vaccine if you're pregnant, trying to get pregnant? This part depends. I know nobody loves the it depends answers, but let's be very thoughtful about this. All of the professional organizations, ASRM, ACOG, SMFM, they have all said, if you are a frontline healthcare worker, so you are at risk of getting COVID, then you should be one, permitted, but two, encouraged to get the vaccination, no matter where you are in your reproductive life, meaning if you're lactating, pregnant, trying to get pregnant, undergoing fertility treatments, you should be offered and encouraged to get the vaccine. So the reason why is let's break it down really fast. Number one, we know that COVID infection is more risky in pregnancy. So if you're already pregnant or you're trying to get pregnant, if you are not protected against COVID and you do get coronavirus infection, you then have higher risk of ICU admission, 
being on a ventilator, needing ECMO and dying. So maternal death is one of the complications of COVID. Pregnancy is a high risk group for COVID. And normally these are low risk people, meaning young women are usually not very high risk for COVID. And yes, maybe though the cause of death isn't very, very high overall, what we are trying to prevent is a catastrophic outcome. That's what all vaccines are trying to do, prevent catastrophe. And so the thought process is that if you get a vaccine that has very low risk, but potential huge benefit, why would you not recommend it? So we know that COVID is serious in pregnancy. And because the vaccine is an mRNA vaccine and has no live virus in it, these are not thought to cause any increased risk of infertility, first or second trimester pregnancy loss, stillbirth, or congenital abnormalities. This is because we know that live viruses can cause these. A good contrasting example is varicella. So varicella is chickenpox. There's something called congenital varicella syndrome. So if you get chickenpox for the first time when you're pregnant, there's well-known birth defects that are associated with it. The vaccine for chickenpox is a live virus vaccine. And so when you get it, you are also getting some of the live virus. Therefore, you can't get vaccinated for varicella when you're pregnant. And you have to wait to conceive for a certain amount of weeks after your last injection if you're trying to get immunized before pregnancy, which we recommend for all women who are not immune to get vaccinated before pregnancy. So the contrast and why you hear different things about different vaccines is it depends on the type of vaccine that we're talking about. So again, this is an mRNA vaccine. And so it is not known or thought or the mechanism action really isn't even there for it to be associated with pregnancy loss, stillbirth, or congenital abnormalities. Agreed that pregnant women were excluded from the initial phase three trials of both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. So we don't have that information completely. That said, pregnancy did happen in both the control and the vaccine group, and there was no higher incidence of miscarriages in either of these vaccine trials. So the whole thought that the vaccine is causing infertility would not be supported by that finding. We should also say that one point I'm hearing a lot is about fever. Yes, we know that fever is not great in pregnancy, and we are concerned that there always has been that high fever in pregnancy, especially the first trimester, could be associated with birth defects. Specifically, these are associated with neural tube defects or a defect in the closure of the spinal cord. Now, number one, this risk is mitigated if the patient is taking greater than 400 micrograms of folic acid daily, which is the recommended amount of prenatal vitamins. If you're taking your prenatal, you should be fine either way. Further, this whole premise has been challenged by population-based cohort studies that have not shown an association between fever and neural tube defects. But also, third, your fever would likely be much higher from the actual virus than from the vaccine. So a fever immune response from a vaccine is likely going to be lower than if you had the actual virus. So if you believed this argument, you would also support getting the vaccine over potentially getting the virus. And number four, you can take an anti-fever medication like Tylenol. That's safe in pregnancy. And that would lower your fever in either circumstance. And then I've had some questions about the allergy situation. Well, it appears that these reports of a anaphylactic or a bad reaction to the vaccine is to what's called PEG or polyethylene glycol, which is part of the lipid coating of the nanoparticles. That's what actually allows it to bind to the cell membrane and allows the mRNA to enter into the cell. It has to get into the cell in order to translate the sequence into proteins. So if you're allergic to PEG, you may be allergic to that in other injectable medications. So you may have had prior allergic reactions. And so that group currently, there's caution about what to do. And so if you have prior allergies, certainly talk to your doctor. We don't really know what the best answer is in that situation. A vaccine is not going to provide 100% immunity. These trials did show that after a two-week period, there was extreme improvement in the risk of contracting the disease, a 95% efficacy in the Pfizer trial. That's fabulous as far as protection. It's a two-shot series, either three or four weeks from the first dose, depending on which vaccine you may get. But it's going to take a large proportion of the population getting immunized in order to achieve any level of herd immunity. One of the biggest things that people get unsolicited advice about is their skin. So if you're tired of hearing that you should just wash your face at night, 
or do this or do that, it's time to get some actual help. And there's a lot of buzz about what's right for you, but in my opinion, it's best to get advice from real experts. And that's why we're excited to partner with Apostrophe. Apostrophe is an online platform that connects you with an expert dermatology team. It allows you to get customized acne treatment for your unique skin. Through Apostrophe, you can get access to both oral and topical medications, things that are used clinically with proven ingredients to help clear acne. Simply fill out an easy online consultation about your skin goals. You'll have a virtual consultation, and then you'll get your own personalized treatment plan. Personally, I love how simple it was to sign up for your visit, the personalized treatment plan, and access to an expert team. We do have a special deal for the audience. You can get your first visit for only $5 at apostrophe.com slash A-A-W when you use our code A-A-W. That's a saving of $15. The code is only available to our listeners. So to get started, go to apostrophe.com slash A-A-W, click get started. Use the code A-A-W to sign up and you'll get your first visit for only $5. Thank you, Apostrophe, for sponsoring this episode. So at least for the foreseeable future, other mitigation strategies such as wearing your mask, socially distancing, all of that good stuff, still going to be very, very important. I am not sitting here advocating that everybody needs to get the vaccine. I don't believe that that is how we practice medicine. I really believe in shared decision making. That means that doctor and patient both talk and come to a conclusion that makes the most sense for each patient. And I'm also going to acknowledge that right now we are specifically talking about That frontline worker, those doctors, nurses, people who are eligible to receive the vaccine right now have been deemed eligible because they are at risk of getting COVID. That is going to be very different than if you work for tech and work from home. If you can socially isolate yourself and you want to say, I'm going to wait until there's more data in pregnancy once pregnant women have received the vaccine and have follow up. And that risk is okay because my risk of getting COVID is so low because I sit at my house, good, good for you. That works. If you, however, are an ER nurse and you show up every day and you're around COVID patients, you need to have serious thought to why you're not getting vaccinated to protect you, protect your child, because we know that if you get the disease, if you get COVID, your chance of getting very sick or dying is higher than the average person. It just is. And so we need to really think about why we would be excluding receiving a potentially life-saving vaccination. I'm also going to say this. I'm going to dive in to the Facebook post that went around saying that getting the COVID vaccine is female sterilization. And I said this in the YouTube video and I'll say it here. I can't believe we're addressing this. Honestly, the claim is so ridiculous. It just goes to show you that using female reproduction and women's health as a political move by other people for their agenda is something that has been done time and time again because it plays at some of our greatest fears. The inability to get pregnant, the idea of having infertility if you do not, or the fear that you are making it worse if you do. It plays upon something that we are all intimately afraid of at some level. And I am not judging you if you read that and you got nervous. Or if you told your friends, I'm not getting it because I saw that it may cause infertility. You're allowed to get more education and change your mind. That's why I put all this content out. You're also allowed to say that it's okay to be scared. I have well-educated people who have reached out to me, nurses, doctors, who are at risk for getting COVID and they were unsure of getting the vaccine or afraid of it. What should I do? What should I do? Or thank you for making those videos. They helped me. I hope that it is encouraging that you are seeing healthcare workers all over this country get vaccinated and post their pictures. Posting pictures, getting the vaccine, being pregnant, breastfeeding. That's really important because it helps show that you're not making a decision alone. We are all trying to make decisions together. And if something hasn't been studied in pregnant women, yet your pregnant doctors are standing in line to get this, They want to do what's best for themselves and their baby also. I promise they're not just blindly getting a vaccine without thinking about the potential risks and the benefits of doing so. So there was a Facebook post that said, former head of Pfizer said COVID vaccination is female sterilization. First of all, the person was not the former head of Pfizer. He did previously work there, but left in 2011. 
and he published this on a blog, not any scientific journal. There was no science behind it, just in his blog. I mean, I have a blog. I can write whatever I want on my blog. Nobody is regulating it. And the thought process there was that the spike protein that your body's making the protein to in the mRNA vaccines has four out of five amino acids similar to syncytion one. Oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. Okay, four out of five. So not even a full five out of five and not even like an 80 amino acid sequence, but four out of five similar to syncytion one. We could probably find four out of five similar to tons of things all over your body, like hemoglobin and pro- other proteins, all kinds of things. But this is the scare tactic. Syncytion one is important in the placenta. True fact, that's true. Syncytion one is part of the protein that helps the syncytial trophoblast, which is part of placentation. So the rumor is that, well, the vaccine's going to cause you to make antibodies to syncytion one. Therefore, your body won't be able to grow a placenta in. Oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. I get fired up every time I talk about this. So this is so ridiculous because first of all, if that were the case, we would see infertility because of failed placentation or a higher association with miscarriage or pregnancy loss or infertility overall in people who've had COVID. Because if you have COVID, you have a spike protein that your body makes antibodies to. So it would make antibodies to syncytion one if there was this huge overlap. So we would be seeing that these women who've had COVID were no longer getting pregnant or were having a higher association of placental failure. And we're not seeing that. We also would not have seen, even though with small numbers, people getting pregnant in the vaccine arm of the group at the exact same rate that people got pregnant in the placebo arm. If this antibody truly made your body not be able to make a placenta, how did 12 people go and get pregnant? That number should have been lower than the other group. Why wasn't there a higher association of miscarriage? These are just logical questions. The other thing is that for your body to recognize something as similar, it needs to like 50 to 80 amino acid sequence to have the body say, oh, look, that may be syncytion one. It's not batting an eye out of four out of five. This guy literally came up with this, pulled it out of his pants to scare people from getting the vaccine. I don't know his whole story, but I'm going to bet if all women didn't get the vaccine, that's a huge portion of the population. And that may hurt Pfizer. And he used to work for Pfizer and he doesn't now. And there's probably some disengruntled nature. He also thinks COVID itself is a hoax. So if he thinks COVID's a hoax, why does he care about the vaccine? Why would you listen to that person when you're trying to make an educated decision for you and your baby or your future baby? As we've already said, COVID is riskier in pregnancy. So if you're contemplating getting a vaccine to protect you, I commend that. And I really want you to have the education you need to make a decision. As far as the male fertility side of things goes, there's a lot we don't know there. We do know, or we have seen reports of a drop in sperm parameters when men have COVID. Now, sperm is very transient. It changes, it fluctuates. So we know that after an illness, even just having a a flu, we will see a drop in sperm counts that recovers. There are some viruses where sperm counts don't recover. Mumps is a great example. Mumps causes atrophy of the testicular tissue. And so what happens is men who've had mumps will not make sperm anymore. We do not think that COVID is functioning like that. However, we do see a drop in sperm counts like we do from other acute infections. Likely we'll recover, but we don't have full data. No reason at all to think this is an antibody-related phenomenon, more a being sick phenomenon. So we don't think that the vaccine would cause any type of male infertility issues. And the virus has been shown to impact male fertility. So for that one, that seems like a no-brainer to me if you're trying to get pregnant and you have the opportunity to get your male partner vaccinated, why would you not? I'm going to admit there's a lot we don't know. We are developing vaccines at a high pace because we are really fortunate to be able to do so. The stars aligned. There was a lot of funding. Companies work together because this is a global pandemic and they want to bring it to an end. The fact that the vaccine was developed so quickly is a testament to science, not a bad thing. I also want you to know that I have no agenda in telling you to get or to not get a vaccine. It does not matter to me, honestly, personally. If you're my patient, we're going to talk about it. I really think the people who are at play right now are the people who are at risk for getting COVID. And to me, our number one thing needs to be not having you get a virus that you could die from. 
we want you to survive. We want you to go on to be pregnant or to have that baby, to breastfeed, to do all the things you want to do. And you and I are on the same team. So we have to really think about why would we not get the vaccine in those situations? And there may be somewhere that's the case where you just don't feel comfortable with it. And ultimately it is your choice and you should not be judged for that. However, I want you to make that decision after evaluating the science and evaluating the studies, thinking about what's right for you. If you have the opportunity to change and go work from home instead of being in the ER, that's a different scenario. And whether you're trying to get pregnant, early pregnancy, or undergoing fertility treatments, you really should make this decision for you and what you think is going to keep you the safest. For us, we are recommending this for our patients who are at risk for getting COVID. We are talking about how their vaccine series may play into their cycles and to other things. But this is a conversation we are having with our patients. We are sharing the updated ASRM guidelines, and we are talking through what the best option is. The last thing I want to say is that if you are not eligible to get a vaccine right now, I don't think your voice needs to be in this conversation besides sharing information. I don't think it's fair to an ER nurse to hear the at-home worker say, I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to risk myself for my baby. You guys are living in different worlds. So if we can support each other as we each try to make the best decision for us, if you are a second tier vaccine eligible person, you should be thankful. You're going to have even more data when it's your opportunity to get the vaccine. And then you can decide what to do with even more data behind your decision. So we should be thankful to those frontline workers, those doctors, nurses, and essential workers who are making the decision on the data that's available at the current moment so that you will have more data at a future time. My YouTube channel is Natalie Crawford, MD. Please go subscribe. I've got two videos on the COVID vaccine and Lord help me. Let's pretend, let's hope these are the last of the COVID video series. I think it's time to talk more about other fertility topics, which there's tons of videos on. I have resources in the show notes over on YouTube for all these studies and these guidelines that I talked about. So if you want more information, go right there. As always, you can follow me on Instagram or TikTok at Natalie Crawford MD. And I appreciate you guys so much. Thank you. My name is Len Webb. And I'm Vincent Williams. We'd like to welcome you to our documentary podcast, The Class of 1989. 1989. Over the course of six episodes, Vincent and I will examine the importance of six black films that came out in 89 and how they shape and influence popular culture, filmmaking, and society in general. Come on, sucker. Let's get it on. New episodes will begin running weekly on March 6th. 